coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Three hours in line and all I got was this stupid keychain? Actually, I really love the keychain. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah? Had a great E3. Yep. I mean, E3 is over for us. Or yep. for me, anyways. Basically, I may still go back tomorrow, but I don't... My dogs are barking. Like, my feet are... My cats are meowing. Yeah. I mean, we both know what we mean when we say this. <laughs> We're old men. And it, uh, it we were on our feet mm-hmm. all day. That's right, uh, on our feet all day for you. Uh, they don't let you sit down when you play any of these games at E3. Mm-mm. None of them. And also, while you're waiting, you got to stand for that too. But worth it most of the time. M- worth it most of the time. Speaking of worth it most of the time, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic Forces. You want to borrow my copy of this game for the Nintendo Switch. You can. All you got to do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at gmail.com with your mailing address or some mailing address that you want this thing to go to. We don't We don't like uh, check these things. No. I mean, I do check to see if that's still like a, a good uh, mailing address. But like, if you give me like your grandma's mailing address, because like you want to play a mean trick on your grandma, I'll do it. I'll send it there. Yeah, that's right. You You can't stop us. No. I send it, and it, it goes everywhere. I mean, I guess suppose you could stop us by sending it to the address that you actually want it sent to. Oh, Although, yeah. if you are playing a mean trick on your grandma, that is the address you want it sent to. Oh, boy. Oh, I don't think we're ever going to think our way out of this conundrum. So, Mark, we should probably just get into talking about our experience at E3 this week. Let's get into it. Games. The story of this is going to be games. No right? surprise. We spent a lot of time at the Nintendo booth. Uh, yeah, we played basically everything at the Nintendo booth that I was interested in playing at the Nintendo booth. Yeah. Um, we started off, do you want to go in uh, chronological order? Sure. I mean, just kind of like, you've probably seen pictures online yes. or video online, but describing the booth, there's a section for Pokemon. Mm-hmm. There's a section for Luigi's Mansion, a, a wonderful section. I loved the Luigi's Mansion Lu- section. Luigi's Mansion was great. And both both these sections were actually pretty cool, right? Like the, uh, the Pokemon thing was built up like a stadium, like one of the gyms in um, Pokemon Sword and Shield. Um, and so like when you're inside, there are like all these drawings of like, Pokemon people and Pokemon like cheering you on. Um, and uh, the Luigi's Mansion thing is like they did a nice facade of the hotel of Luigi's Mansion. And there are dudes outside wearing uh, pink jackets and hats. Yeah, like bellhop costumes. Yeah. And let me, t- let me tell you, we coveted these jackets. I wanted one so bad. Yeah. Until we saw them on a white guy. That's right. They didn't look great on white guys. Everyone else looked great. In Amazing, them. white guys. No, it's not a good color. It's 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 all right, <laughs> but just they look like fun. geeks. They do. They look like <laughs> nerds, which is of course our problem with the Sobble as well. Um, so uh, yeah, it's uh, Nintendo in uh, the last couple of years has done like a singular theming to their booth. Uh, last year was Smash Brothers. Before that, it was uh, Mario Odyssey, and before that was Hyrule. Breath of the Wild. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this was uh, this kind of broke that pattern where they had a, a couple different themes throughout. Um, and I, I guess they had like sort of a mini area for um, the Link's Awakening. Yeah, that's right. So there was like Pokemon, which had a dedicated gym theme. Luigi's Mansion, which had like a haunted hotel theme. Yes. And then behind that was... They had a section just called Other Games. Right. Uh, and at first, this is where Link's Awakening uh, resided. That's right. Link's Awakening was also just considered another game on Tuesday. Right. Which is an outrageous thing, to con- like conceptually speaking. Huge mistake. Nintendo, it's a Zelda game. Like People are going to want to play this thing. Uh, and I think that uh, b- between Tuesday and Wednesday, they realized the error of their ways. And they were like, okay, we got to remove Zelda from the other games and sort of make it its own thing. 
Uh, but like they already had more stations for it than they did for the other other games. Yeah, absolutely. And there were like little dioramas. Uh, Link's Awakening definitely got more of a to do than like yes. Resident Evil Five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it should be. Maybe. I mean, they're both old games coming to Switch, so I don't know. <laughs> um, but so we played a bunch of these games. Um, and uh, so how, how how do you want to tackle this? Uh, I don't know. I guess we can just talk about it maybe in the order that we played them. Okay, great. So uh, we started off with Pokemon Sword and or Shield. Um, it was unclear from the demo which one we were playing. Um, and uh, so this uh, walks you through the water gym. Um, and the new uh, gym leader, Nessa? Nessa, maybe? Maybe her name is Nessa. Nobody knows. Um, and, uh, you know, out, outfits uh, the player with um, six level 50 Pokemon, including all three starters, um, a Wooloo, uh, the uh, Yamper, which is this, like, electric Corgi with, like, a little heart on his butt. Love Yamper. Yamper's great. Uh, and there was one more. I think the, the Corva Knight was, was also in, in the party there. Um, and the gym is a little bit, like, puzzle solvy, uh, where, like, there are these... Um, it's it's water themed, so there are pipes, and you can like hit buttons to change like what pipes are spitting out water and which pipes aren't. And your path is either like open or blocked depending on which colored yes. switches you have hit. Yeah, so you know it's it's some real basic problem solving. Um, but there was at least like half a second where I was like, wait, what do I do next? Um, but you know, tackled it and figured it out. It actually made it feel a little bit more like the, uh, um. The, what were they called? The trials or uh, from uh, Sun and Moon? Yeah, yeah. It just felt like there was uh, it was offering a little bit more to the gameplay than just Pokemon Battle. Um, and then a- at the end of it, you go out into the stadium itself and fight. Um, maybe Nessa. N- maybe Nessa. <laughs> um, and uh, the final Pokemon that she throws out, uh, you she does a Dynamax on the Pokemon. You do a Dynamax on your Pokemon, and uh, the Dynamax is cool. Like. Uh, these kind of ceremony around watching your Pokemon get like ten times its normal, maybe even more. It's huge. They get so big, uh, hilariously so. And then all of their um, attacks become like more exciting attacks um, that also then like affect what's happening on the field. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was it, it was neat. It was fun, and but I mean, it was kind of just like it was Pokemon. Yeah, like it wasn't bad. It was probably the least interesting of yeah. the stuff that we saw, only because. Um, all the open worlds, I, things that they're adding to Sword and Shield, like we didn't get experience any of that. It was just the just gym. Just the gym. But yeah. seeing the giant Grookey, worth it. Look, man, I am never going to get sick of seeing a giant Grookey. He has little fangs and he gets so mad. He's like banging his stick. Oh my God, he gets so mad. I love it. Uh, so then uh, immediately after that, we saw Luigi's Mansion, uh, which again, we had to uh, say hello to some very finely dressed gentlemen and go into this uh, hotel. Yeah. And it was really fun. Like mm-hmm. it was like kind of dark and uh, black lit in there. Yeah. And they had different like panels or windows where or seemingly windows where like ghosts would show up and then fly away and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There were also portraits of like Mario, Peach and Luigi, and they all had like big red X's on them. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was cool. Um, and there was a dude in a Luigi costume, like walking around, or like a mascot costume, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I said to report, no, we did not get hugs with him. No, we, I wanted to. Yeah, but by the time that we were walking in and saw him, we had to go to our demo stations. Right. And he had, Luigi had left to go do something else at that point. What, whatever else Luigi does when not meeting and greeting at the Luigi's Mansion demo. Um, what did you think of uh, Luigi's Mansion? So I thought it was really fun. Having not really played uh, Dark of the Moon, mm-hmm. the second one for 3DS, I thought it was great. I The controls of Luigi's Mansion are always a little weird to wrap your head around, especially in a demo situation. I don't know what it was. I feel bad for the lady who was like helping me through it. Yeah. like Even the very beginning, when you were supposed to... Because there's the new moves in... Uh, luigi's mansion 3 where you can kind of like bash you like yeah. suck a ghost in but then before they're all the way in you can just like hit them you back and forth back like, and forth yeah slap them around a little and bit slap them against each other <laughs> and i like for the life of me could not trigger that to work so i couldn't get past the tutorial and then i am so sad to report i died in this demo oh no <laughs> and i was just like i can't believe i died in luigi's mansion and i think the woman would have let me restart because it was so sad and pathetic. But you just ran away and <laughs> I embarrassed I just ran me. away. 
<laughs> well, fear... I at least got kind of far into okay, it before right, I died. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> well, fear not, because I beat it. I beat this demo. Um, it, uh, I, I like the, uh, it started with like a little cinematic, which I ended up skipping a couple, uh, seconds into it. And I know you skipped it too, but yeah. it, it just, uh, you know, nicely sets up, uh, Luigi and Mario and the princess are, uh, riding a bus to, um, to this haunted hotel. Um, and it just, you know, it's like a nice little moment of just like the, all of them on the bus and like it, everything seems very peaceful. Um, and then I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah skip. I want to see Luigi fight ghosts. Um, and the game is cool. Like um, the Gooigi stuff uh, where you can like make a second version of Luigi who has slightly different physical characteristics. Um, I thought lent to some really interesting puzzles in the game where you would have to deploy Gooigi and he would like walk through some spikes and like, you know, uh, flip a switch or whatever. But like they're kind of uh, greater variations on that. Yeah, I'm interested to see how that is elaborated on in the actual game. Yeah. Um a- after the demo was over, uh the like my handler there was like, "Oh, you know, how how did you like it?" And I said, "I like the Guigi stuff. It felt like uh like the Lost Vikings to me." And he went, "Whoa, throwback." And then I remembered I was old. Yeah, I think you're going to have to explain what the Lost Vikings is. So the Lost Vikings is a game that uh Blizzard made a super long time ago on the Super Nintendo that involves uh, three characters who are all Vikings and they all have radically different abilities. One of them can run and jump. The other, uh, another one has a sword and a bow and arrow. And the third one has a shield that he can either block with or hold above his head to glide. Um, and those are the only abilities they have. And it's like a puzzle platforming kind of game where you control uh, all three of them, but not at the same time. Like you have to switch between them. Um, and when you control one, the other two are just like sitting there. So you have to use their abilities, like switching off between the characters to get into different spaces or like clear out something that the other ones wouldn't be able to clear out. Um, and it just, this game really, Luigi's Mansion really gave me uh, vibes of that sort of uh, puzzle solving. Yeah, I went into the demo not really, feeling kind of like indifferent on Luigi's Mansion 3. Yeah. But uh, playing it, yeah. And leaving, I felt, e- even though I died in a humiliating fashion. And then I was ran ex- away crying. <laughs> I was just expecting that in a E3 demo, I didn't have to like worry about my health that much. Turned you, out to not be true. You gotta watch your health and pick up those hearts. The ghosts are dropping hearts. Um, I'll shame you on the <laughs> show. I don't care. <laughs> but yeah, now I'm looking forward to Luigi's Mansion 3. I'm especially looking forward to the Scare Scraper. Oh yeah, I think that has the potential to be really, really fun to get some like multiplayer. Yeah, mm-hmm. that'll, uh, yeah, uh, that that will be uh, really cool. And it was around this time that I ran into Charles Martinet. That's right, the who, voice of Mario and Luigi, of course, and Wario, right, and Waluigi. That's right. Um, he was just kind of like walking the line, saying hi to people, and you know, not everybody knew who he was, but the people who did. We're super excited. Yeah. Um, our friend, Matt Acevedo, mm-hmm. he got a picture with him. Yep. And I'm sad that I missed the opportunity to get a scoop and be like, Charles, are you the voice of Mario in Illumination Entertainment's Super Mario movie? Yeah. But you, I didn't do that. You missed the opportunity. Yeah. And now you're reminding of, us of it here. This is just as bad as dying in Luigi's Mansion, Mark. Possibly worse. Because <laughs> this maybe. would be breaking news. This would put us on the map. That's right. Um, we want so badly to be on the map. Guys, <laughs> if you know who's in charge of putting things on the map, uh, email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. And, uh, you know, let us know. Um, all right. So then after, so th- this was all uh, of our Nintendo exploits on Tuesday. Um, Today, Wednesday, we went back and first we hit up the other games. Um, so there were a lot of games that they had back here, um, including uh, a couple that we played. Uh, let's start with Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order. I'm a little bit surprised that this didn't get, I guess, more of a presence, that it was just thrown in yeah, with the other ones. I agree. Although I suppose... I think there were more of more demo stations. Of yeah, it, though. probably. Uh, this played, if you've played either of the Marvel Ultimate Alliance games, this played, to my mind, exactly like those. I haven't played it, one of those games, since the second one came out. Yeah. But um, my memory of it is that it played exactly like this. I'm very excited for this game. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I liked that it was... I mean, when, when you say if you like played a previous one that you'll like recognize the gameplay, I was a little bit worried that it was just going to be like a 
you know, run around and like jam on the buttons to attack. Um, but like during our course of play, I discovered like the that there is more depth to deploying your uh, special abilities and like everyone controls differently and has uh, different special moves and all that stuff. So like it it does feel like a, you know, full featured version of this game. Yeah. And the real joy in these games for me is like seeing how the characters interact with each other. Totally. And I think in the demo, there were 13 or 12 or something that you could choose from. There were a lot of characters. Yeah. Um, but Mark, the, Mark played as Captain America. That's right. I played as Storm. Uh, and the two guys that we were playing with were Spider-Man and Peter Quill. And so it was just fun to see how those abilities like matched up. Mm-hmm. And also if you pick like certain combinations of characters, obviously you have like classic combinations. Right. Yeah, and if you if you like highlight that, and I think maybe they've mentioned this uh, in like official press about the game, but if you like select a team of all like X Men, then like you get some kind of bonus for that, or of original Avengers, or you know w- w- whatever. Um, so th- those will all be fun uh, kind of combinations to explore. Um, then, uh, oh sorry, I was just yeah, gonna go say that. So that was another game where you know I was looking forward to because I'd played the old ones, yeah. but I didn't really. Um, I don't know. I didn't have any hype for it, but now that I actually went hands on with it, I'm way more excited for that game leaving E3 than I was previously. Yeah, I think that'll be a great couch co op, like just you playing with your buddies. That definitely seems like the way to do um, it. It's gonna be so much fun in that way. Uh, then at this point, Mark and I split up. We split up. If you can imagine it, can you imagine it? Uh, Mark went over to Wolfenstein Youngblood, and I went over to Mario and Olympic Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Uh, Mark, how was Wolfenstein? So I didn't end up playing it. Uh, the people in front of me, their demo crashed. Yeah. And so uh, I was talking to the Bethesda guy, and I felt like I, I had had enough of, sure, of from, from watching Wolfenstein at that point. I think it, it looks really good. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how like the co-op aspect of it works on Switch. Yeah. Because... You know, there's no split screen co op. So the only way that you could play local co op is if you have two copies of the game and two switches. And I don't really know how online will work because voice chat seems like it'll be an integral part of getting through this game. Like it, it seemed like they the like coordination was important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. But it looks amazing. Like yeah. it, it is visually very stunning. I just don't know how like good of a fit it is because co-op is such a yeah like big part of this game yeah it's it, i think always important to remember that like the limiting factor of what games make sense on switch isn't necessarily like what how graphically demanding it is um but like yeah if it requires like good online infrastructure that like switch isn't going to be really a good home for it yeah it's this i feel kind of the same way about resident evil 5 yeah. Where if you want to do, you know, like play with a friend, although that had local co op, as in like split screen co op. So mm. it's possible that the Switch version is w- will as well. But if you're trying to do it online, again, it seems like you'll just have to have, you'll have to call them on Discord or something. Yeah, totally. Um, and then, so I'm over there playing Mario and Sonic, Sonic at the Olympic Games. Um, I, I think maybe on uh, Tuesday I expressed some like ex- uh, semi excitement for it. Uh, I, it. The game revealed itself to me as like kind of a shallow collection of uh, mini games, um, which I assumed that it would be. Um, but you know, I liked every now and then to entertain flights of fancy, wherein something isn't the disappointing thing I assume it's going to be. Um, it you know, of course, is cute because you have Mario characters and Sonic characters, and look, you can make them surf. And everyone wears a wetsuit, except for Bowser. So, like, it's cute. Mario wears a wetsuit. Why do you think Bowser doesn't wear a wetsuit? Just because, like, the logistics of him putting it over his shell? Maybe. Yeah, maybe, like, someone had the job, like, okay, okay, now you have to design Bowser's wetsuit. And they were like, okay. And they, they, like, like, went crazy trying to do it, and so they just couldn't get it in the game. Right, that guy shot himself. (laughs) They're like, okay, okay, he doesn't wear one. Some sort of, like, Lovecraftian story. (laughs) Um, so, yeah, but I, I think it, this is imminently uh, ignorable, like yeah, all previous at, entries. Like, at the series. very end, I played the skateboard minigame with you, and it was fine. I was Bowser. I was skateboarding, you know, like, doing some simple Tony Hawk pro skater tricks. Yeah. But there wasn't anything, like, spectacular about it, for sure. Yep. 
And then uh, after I checked out Wolfenstein, but before I met up with you to skateboard with Bowser, I went <laughs> and looked at uh, Elder Scrolls Blades. Yeah. Tell me about Elder Scrolls mobile Elder game Blades. that uh, Bethesda announced is coming to Switch. So it definitely seems like a mobile game. Sure. Um, it, the demo was pretty short, but it was basically you were in a wooded area, but the path that you're taking is just very direct. There was like one like secret area, which wasn't particularly difficult to find yeah um and there is obviously more to the game than was just in the demo and i haven't played the mobile version at all because you're gathering resources like wood and stuff like that so i assume there's some sort of crafting mechanic or or something that you're using all these resources for yeah but the combat just seemed kind of like blah yeah and um like visually it's not all that interesting so it is excuse me it is free to play Hmm. So maybe we're checking out in for that when, reason alone. Like out, you yeah. can draw your own conclusions, but I wasn't particularly impressed. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, neither of us were like excited or even I would say interested in that at all before um, we walked into that other games area. Walking out of the other games area, we said, "You see that line over there? The one that says Link's Awakening end of line? Uh, let's go over there." Uh, so we did, and we stand in this line, and we stand in this line for a long time. Yeah, definitely the longest we stood in the line, all E3. Yeah, um, and uh, this we we got in the we got in the line at about what ten? Uh, 10? 11, yeah, probably 11, about ten. About ten o'clock, um, and we had uh, uh, tickets to see the Final Fantasy VII remake at one. So we were like, okay. This should be fine. We should do this, and then we should, uh, you know, walk over to the other hall and see Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, but we it got we were in this line for so long, and it just like kept getting like uh, the the further we got in the line, the slower it seemed to go. Um, and we were so excited to play Link's Awakening, but also it was like, oh, can we do this and see Final Fantasy? Can we do both? Yeah, I felt like Liz Lemon in uh, the Sandwich Day episode where she's trying to have her sandwich and get through the airport. Yeah. She can have it all, Mark. And could we as well? So we were jamming sandwiches down our, our throats while waiting in line for this game. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's Link's Awakening. Like, you got to try, right? You got to try to play this game before going over to see Final Fantasy VII. Uh, and we did. We were successful in seeing both. Um, so uh, Link's Awakening, Mark, what would you think? This game is so cute. It is so cute. So I think for an episode we did last year, maybe, I had replayed Link's Awakening on the 3DS, but it was the Game Boy version. Yeah. And, you know, it's a super fun game that still holds up to a point. Yes. But there was something about seeing that same, like, world rendered with modern technology and, like, modern niceties that, like, in Link's Awakening on the Game Boy, I didn't really want to linger in the town and go fishing or do any of that stuff. I was more just like focused, like, let's go through the quest because having to get through the big dialogue boxes and battle yeah. with like the two buttons, like all that kind of stuff, just when you're playing it now, takes away from it a little bit. But in the demo, you pretty much just had free reign at the start of the game. Yes. So you could go do the dungeon or you could just go hang out in the town. And I spent the majority of the 15 minutes we had with it just hanging out in the town, going fishing, walking around, yeah. interacting with people, going into like shops and all Did that kind of stuff. Did you steal from the shop? I didn't. I didn't okay. steal from the shop. Coward. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to. I'm looking forward to doing that right. in the game. It's just, it's so cute. Yeah. Even like the way that like Link walks, it has like a rhythm to it that I was unexpected. I... I was bowled over. I loved it. Yeah. And I don't know if it is a trick of them also having like the, the dioramas um, in, in the space too. Um, but like the everything, all of the objects in the game felt like they had the physical characteristics of the diorama objects. So like the trees uh, look like they're made out of plastic and like they're being well lit by like diorama lighting. So like they're casting off a, a you know pretty severe reflection. Like everything just feels very real. And very physical, which is not, um, it's not something that I associate with, you know, certainly not with, like, the original Link's Awakening. Like, you know, I recognize that those are all just, like, dots on a Game Boy screen. Um, but this felt very much like, 
you know, the same sort of joy of like uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas or like Coraline or whatever, where you're like, these exist in. Yeah, it, feel, it seems very tactile. It, absolutely. Yeah. The other thing that was really super fun to see is, um, you know, like all the enemy placement and the world, everything is exactly how you just remember totally it. Totally the same. Yeah. But everything's just like turned up a notch. Like all the enemies have personality. Yeah. And like the animations are really nice. And, you know, when you encounter the raccoon or tanuki or whatever it is, it's, like, slapping its belly like crazy. Like, it's just so cute. Everything has so much personality, which this game was known for originally mm -hmm. on the yeah. DS in that, like, low fidelity. So it's nice to see... A Game Boy on the Game Boy. Oh, sorry, yeah. on the Game Boy. So it's, like, amazing to see that they're able to uh, make that personality shine even more in yeah. the remake. It also sounds amazing. Um, Mark and I broke our uh, n no headphones for me, please rule for this one because like we wanted to hear um, all the music in its you know fully orchestrated glory, um, and it's all the tunes that you remember from the original game. Um, like it, the game just looks and sounds great, and uh, you know we know that we're getting this like uh, building the the dungeon uh, mode to this as well uh, along with the the color dungeon from the DX version of this game um so you know i don't know if it's going to be uh have a ton of like new gameplay content in it but like just to experience the world the way it looks uh you know is more than worth it for for me yeah it's interesting that it almost feels like in the way that it was presented in the booth and everything that Nintendo is kind of treating this as more of a minor release. You yeah. Know? But yeah. the reception at E3 was anything but. Yeah. Like, yes. I mean, it it was easier for us to, we got into, I mean, we had appointments for both of them, but like um, we got into both Pokemon and Luigi's Mansion much quicker. And even, you know, our friends that didn't have appointments were able to get into those games much more quickly. Um, so like, yeah, I, I think, Nintendo may not really have a gauge on like which of the three games they're putting out are uh, resonate, well, maybe just resonating the most with people, the kinds of people who go to E3. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, but I mean, I, I think Link's Awakening is going to be a big deal. I think people are just excited about Zelda. Like after Breath of the Wild, yeah, we're excited about a Breath of the Wild sequel, but just the name Zelda has its, you know, has such cachet right now that um, I think they were underestimating it. I'm really glad it's coming in September. I'm really excited to play the full game. Um, all games are coming in September, Mark. Um, speaking of uh, all games, we are going to move on now from the things that we experienced at the Nintendo booth. Um, some of these games that we're going to be talking about might be com coming to Nintendo systems, but uh, you know we're, we're going a, a little bit broad on this one. Um, so uh, hang out if you want to hear that. And otherwise, uh, if you're... Like, no, Nintendo only for me. Uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> so we make our way over to the Final Fantasy VII remake uh, booth where we have our appointment for one uh, between 1 o'clock and one fifty. We arrive at what time, Mark? <laughs> like one fifty two. Yeah. No, no, we get there at one fifty. We get there by at the time, like, yeah. the hubbub is yeah. all taken care of. It's like one fifty two, Right. So, like, we have to, like, kind of sweet talk the guy to, like, let us into the line. I mean, you, you guys know us. We just turned on the charm. Oh, yeah. We are all sugar. No. What was the bad one? Uh, all, all. Uh, talk. Yeah. Well, Cause, here. Because it's, it's all talk, no, no sugar. sugar. We so, were if we're all, all sugar. And all sugar. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We bring them both. We were the full package. We're the talk and the sugar. Um, so we, we go in and, uh, you, you know, after this guy gives us a, a hard time getting in line, um, and there's like a, a presentation video, um, that is, uh, you know, basically just like giving us the lay of the land to Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. I mean, Square Enix definitely, they had like an Avengers section yes. that, um, was like Avengers prison. I don't really know what that was supposed to be. Yeah. It, it did, did not seem pleasant. But the Final Fantasy VII remake area, it was Midgar. Yes. And, um, you know, it had the feel of that. There were, like, two uh, employees who were, I guess, just mean Midgar people. They, they were Shinra employees. Oh, yes, uh, yes, of, of course. Of the Shinra Corporation, yeah. who is, you know, an evil corporation. Um, but, like, yeah, there was one of them, at least, who was, like, taking this role very seriously. And was just, like, walking through the line, like, staring people down and, like, giving them crap. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, then we, we get in and there's like a theater area and we watch this thing and then, you know, out into the like main demo section where we can play, you know, with the fir- very first part of the game, uh, which is what you would expect if you had, have played Final Fantasy VII in the past, um, where you start the beginning of, um, uh, Cloud's first mission with Avalanche and play through the, uh, giant scorpion thing that you may have seen in the trailers. Um, Mark, what'd you what'd you think of I this game? I loved it. I thought it was I loved so it. good. I thought this combat was so fun. It looks amazing. I was really worried before, or not even worried. I was just indifferent to the remake a little bit. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I I was worried that it w- was going to be just like Kingdom Hearts three, sure, kind of like action combat. But the way that they have done the uh, like ATB system yes. is really smart because it's still like uh action focused and even when you're in like time slows down when you trigger it and you can like access all like the atb like the menus and everything so you can choose So this is all 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 of your special abilities and magic spells and using items and stuff yeah so there's still that like tactical aspect but um i can't remember where i was going with that i loved it i I thought it was just really cool yeah i mean and it's still like the the thing that it still feels frantic um so like even when you're slowing down time you're like you're still moving like your characters are still moving very slowly and you are like still taking damage potentially yeah um but then like to build up your gauge you have to keep attack you have to keep doing like your regular attack which doesn't deal like that's not how you're dealing big damage is by uh swinging your your blade um but that is how you build up your atb meter uh so yeah i mean it, it feels like a really satisfying combination of um real time and menu based combat. Yeah, like a real smart update. Yeah. Totally. For, I didn't think they'd be able to please both, but I kind of think they might have pulled it off. Yeah, I think they did too. And I think uh, another part of it and at least that played really well in the demo um was that uh when you're doing your regular attacks, it doesn't feel like nothing, you know? Like I I'm always worried in a uh a, a thing that combines real time and or, you know, any, like, real-time combat role-playing game that your attacks aren't going to feel like they land. You know, like, you're going to see your character animation where, like, they swing their sword, and then you're going to see the enemy uh, animation where, like, they get hit. But, like, all of this felt like one solid thing that was happening. Uh, Cloud is swinging his buster sword, it hits the bad guy, and we see the bad guy react to it in a way that uh, makes sense and feels impactful. But it doesn't feel like an action game. Like, you don't have to do a lot of um, controlling. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't have, like, if there were, the, I can't remember what they're called, but there were, like, the um, enemies that would, like, fly up a little bit. Yeah, like, and, like little like, eyeball things. Right, and you don't have to, you don't have to jump to attack them right. when they're right, in the right. air. Like, as long as you're aiming at that enemy, as long as they're targeted, then Cloud will, like, do all of that for you. The other thing I really liked about it, in general, especially in, like, action RPGs, I don't love switching between characters in combat. Yeah. Um, I find it just kind of, like, overwhelming, and um, I just want to be focused on, like, what one character is doing. It makes me feel out of control a little bit. Sure. Uh, and not really knowing what's going on. But I didn't feel that way in this demo when you're switching between, like, because you have to. You have to switch between Barrett and Cloud. And uh, I thought that worked really well as well. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if it'll feel different when you've got a third character uh, in there. Or, I mean, if this game even actually supports that. I guess we don't really know. Um, But, like, yeah, I liked how the difference between Cloud and Barrett. You know, Barrett's got the gun on his arm, so he's going to be uh, your your ranged attack guy. um, That, like, it made sense in my mind. Like, oh, I'm switching to this character for this reason. Um, And then also, uh, as soon as the fight is done... Um, like it's really cool the way it knows when the f- the encounter is done because like it the music doesn't change uh, or whatever but like experience points pop up and it automatically returns your control to cloud um, so like he's always in the lead um, but yeah I, I I thought this was great like I'm very excited for this game to actually come out yeah me too um, other stuff that we saw on the show floor um well we we didn't get to play but we did see a sort of extended gameplay demo for um lego skywalkers the skywalk lego what am i saying lego star wars the skywalker saga yeah it wasn't available to play but you could see like a hands-off demo yeah um and so they uh i mean when they say that they're like re that these aren't like hd remakes of the uh originals 
Um, that is 100% correct. Like they, they take each movie in the uh, nine movie series and uh, create what seemed to be like a series of open worlds for each one. So like the demo that they showed us was uh, they went into Return of the Jedi and brought us to Tatooine, but like started by flying into Tatooine and they were like, this is open space. You can fly around. It's open world space. You yeah, can fly in space. And like on, ta- and there were um, like dog fights that yep. you get into with like TIE fighters that mm-hmm. they said were randomized. Yeah, random encounters. Um, and then w- as you're flying to Tatooine, there's like three areas in yeah. the demo that you could potentially land on. Yeah. Uh, and like, I, I don't know, ev- everything about this seemed great. Like, uh, there, there was a, a split second where I felt myself going like, oh man, I just wish this wasn't a Lego Star Wars game. I just wish it was a, a Star Wars game with the same sort of scope to it. Um, but there is something really nice and really freeing about like the ability to be silly with the Legos um, that I really liked and I think that showed really well in this game. Yeah, I haven't played a Lego, one of those like Lego games mm-hmm. for a really long time. The last time I really played them was on Wii. And then I think we played a little bit of like one of the Marvel ones on oh, the yeah. PS3. Yeah. But uh, so with that much space between Lego experiences for me, I was kind of blown away with what the games could be now. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, they look really good. Did we get any indication if this was coming to Switch or not? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Okay. Um, and co-op is also uh, a feature in these games. So, like, they are everything that we expect um, and then a lot more. Um, so, I'm I'm very excited for this. Also, you know us. We're big suckers for Star Wars. So, like, yeah, we're there. Totally. Um, then other games that we saw, Mark, you played Rune Factory 4. That's, yeah, um, at like the Xseed booth. I played it for a little bit. It was one of those demos where you're kind of like, I have no idea what this game is actually going to be. Yeah. Because Rune Factory 4 is a mix between Harvest Moon and like an RPG. So there's combat in it. Um, and you, it's just hard to do all of that in, um, unfocused demo yeah we're totally. like well do i go do like farm stuff where am i in this world yeah you know well, who, this who was... am i as a character and what are like my relationship to the right. other people because that's a big part of like a harvest moon type game yeah and this was also this was one of those like almost totally hands-off demos like uh hands off of us demos where like you just walked up to a machine and started playing it mm-hmm. um and sometimes it's nice to get a little bit more uh, of like a framing device to really understand what the the game is or why it means anything that being said i love rpgs mm. i love harvest moon there you go and so a combination of the two sounds great this seems to be exactly what's on the tin so i am looking forward to rune factory 4 uh then we also played uh, burger time party uh which is the like 30 years later sequel to burger time <clears throat> uh mark what did you think of, of burger time party uh, not much. Yeah, I mean, it's basically Burger Time, which is cute, but like, a, you know, like an arcade uh, sort of, I was going to say arcade curiosity, but I don't even think it's rare enough to be considered a, a curiosity. Um, and they really didn't update the gameplay at, at all. Um, like, it is still very much, you climb a ladder, you walk across a piece of a burger, it falls to the platform below it. Um, and like, the enemies aren't any more varied than they were, uh, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I, the the only thing that this does offer is uh you know a ton of different stages and you know a bunch of different uh completion um uh like requirements for you to earn like one two or three stars when you finish these things and you know we only played a a little bit um but i have kind of a hard time imagining that i would want to like oh let's go back in there we 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 can get three stars this time um i just didn't really feel like it was that kind of game yeah the one thing they did change is the graphical style yeah which is very to me it's like somebody saw cuphead and was like oh we should do that like this like 1930s style of animation but like in motion it reads way more like flash animation than like cuphead does totally um and it you know part of that is cuphead like commits to it with like the uh the like film grain and like the little uh like pop in uh but like this and it um, looks like it's actually animated where yes. this d- doesn't have that illusion at all it's more just like the char- the like style of the characters yeah yeah totally yeah. um but i i think it it suffers from that like to say that they took inspiration from cuphead is to imply that we like it i think <laughs> sure <laughs> or at least that we respect it right. it's just like i don't know it's kind of kind of a bummer um 
And then uh, the last game that we're going to talk about is we watched a little bit of Harvest Moon Mad Dash. Um, now, Mark and I were like, well, wait a minute. Hold on. What, what is this game? It's a Harvest Moon game. What is it? Yeah. Is it a little bit Mario Party? Is, is it, it a little, little bit, bit overcooked? overcooked? And it seems like no. Oh, it's, well, I mean, I, it thought seems it's, like, I thought it seemed like yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it seems like overcooked, yeah. kind of, but it's also like a match three puzzle. It's definitely a Harvest Moon spinoff. That yeah, much we can that tell much we sure. can that, that much we definitely know. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really have too much exciting to say about this other than um, like it, it looked sort of neat and is something that I'll uh, listen for like more news on um, as we uh, as the year goes on here. All right, that's what we played at E3. Were you at E3? What did you play? Tell us. Email us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. And then we can uh, talk about that. All right, Mark, let's close out this segment of the show. And you know what? That's going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, the week of E3. Um, we had a good time. We had a good show. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I hope you have enjoyed uh, hearing about our exploits. Um, if you would, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. That helps us out uh, a bunch. If you like this episode and you think other people should know about uh, the other games section at the Nintendo booth, uh, share, share us on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell, and the show is at Nincart Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape at Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apeatbetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening. And happy E3.